Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this session of our webinar series. My name is Roland, and today we are joined by Tally's very own Larry Feige and Mike Brownson of Westel Technologies. We'll be talking about UL2524, what it is, why it is, and what it includes. But before we do, I'd like to introduce Larry Feige. Larry, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Hi. My name is Larry Feige. I've been with Tally 14 plus years in the industry, 40 plus years. And we're here today to uh, bring you uh, Westel demystifying UL2524. And it's going to be presented by Mike Brownson. And Mike has uh, also had extensive uh, time in the industry. Mike Brownson, Westel, please take it away. Oh, thank you, Larry. As Larry noted, I've been around the industry for a while, uh, also 40 plus years, and started actually in the in-building wireless space. My first project was over 20 years ago. I was fortunate to have been in the business in an area where the public safety radio was early mandated, city of Denver. So I had a project I was involved with with them, actually one of their very first projects in the city in building radio coverage for their 800 meg radio system. A little bit of background there. And I'm the director of business development with Westel. So I wear a lot of hats there. I help with marketing, uh, but I've also been very involved in the product development side. Uh, given the years in the industry and, and my relationships throughout the industry and throughout the country, uh, I hear a lot about what the integrators want, what the HJs want, some of the challenges. And so this is talking about UL2524. All right, so for those that aren't familiar with what UL2524 is, um, we'll tell you that and we'll provide a little bit, of, uh, little bit of background into what it is, why it is, and what it includes. But essentially, it's the new UL standard specifically for public safety BDAs uh, and active components. So let's first talk about the role of UL and the other nationally recognized testing labs, All right? So UL actually is two totally separate companies, right? They have, there's a standards organization, which is the original UL, it goes way back, I think over a hundred years now, some, some relationship to uh, Thomas Edison, I hear, anyhow. Um, so you've got that UL that basically it's a nonprofit organization that writes the standards through uh, input, peer input, industry input, um, and creates these standards. And then you have the UL that's one of 19 nationally recognized testing labs. So on the screen here, we see you know, uh, the, the logos of all of the NERDLs. Now, not all NERDLs can test to all standards. There's some specialties, um, but just wanted to explain that there's a that UL is just one of actually a couple of different ANSI recognized standards organizations. So that's where the UL 2524 came about. So back in December of 2017, uh, the UL engineers first published an outline for investigation. Then after uh, almost a year of public input and there's also a standards technical panel that looks at this public input and they debate things and then decide what the final version is and vote on it. It was approved as an ANSI standard in October 18th of 2018. Since then, the industry has been working hard to, to come up with the solutions because you know, we know that more demand, more opportunity for uh, listed BDAs is, is coming. Um, you know, when we look at what UL2524 addresses, okay, first, let me be very clear, it only addresses the active components, all right, and there's a handful of, of parts to it, all right, so one aspect of it is they test for the risk of fire and shock, right, because they don't want to be, uh, you know, to have BDAs going out in the market that are hazardous or going to cause a fire. Uh, they also test for water resistance. So that's that NEMA 4, although NEMA 4 is actually 
self-tested. Uh, this would be tested by a NERDLE to that NEMA, NEMA type four uh, water resistance. There's also standards in there that mandate testing for the basic IFC NFPA type functionality, such as do the alarms work, does oscillation management, that sort of thing. Does, does, it, does it do the sort of functions that are mandated by code? So the things that are not addressed are things like the design of a system, the installation of a system, the commissioning of a system, and of course then all of the other non-powered components like coax and splitters and fiber. So none of that's included. Um, so I guess one of my cautions there is in my 20 years of in-building wireless experience, the performance and reliability of a public safety DAS system probably is 90% has to do with the design, the install, and the commissioning. And about 10% is the equipment itself. Well, so UL2524 addresses that 10%, all right? I'm not saying it's not needed, uh, there's benefits to it, but if there's a BDA manufacturer out there that's claiming that a UL2524 listed solution is going to assure firefighters and first responders that they're going to have reliable, consistent communications in buildings, and maybe, maybe not. Take that with a grain of salt, okay? So we just got to be able to filter through some of the claims of what UL2524 is and what it isn't. So digging a little deeper, the a lot of, uh, for example, like all Westel BDAs, um, we get them all UL listed for electrical safety under the industrial standard equipment, uh, which was UL60950. And that's being sunset and being replaced by UL62368. So when you look at UL2524 testing standard, an awful lot of it, like, like maybe even about half of the document is that testing, all right? So what we do at Westel is we first get that listing under 60950 or now 62368, and then we submit it to 2524 because, well, that means all of that testing is already done by inertal so they can use that and then to that, they'll do the water testing, which is part of UL 508. Um, and the NFPA functionality, like I said, that's like verifying the oscillation protection, the functionality of the alarms. Uh, if there's uh, devices, for example, like the, um, the remote enunciator connection to the BDA BBU, that line needs to be monitored for integrity. So if there's a fault there, an open or short to ground, you'll get a notification of that. Uh, now, there's also additional durability testing. All right, so they'll, they'll test for, uh, you know, how hot the components get. Uh, they'll do some strike tests. So that's an, also a small part of the testing standard. But I want you to notice, there's absolutely no RF performance testing in UL2524, right? Uh, UL leaves that up to the FCC, because FCC, uh, part 90 explains pretty well the RF performance requirements, uh, predominantly things like spurious noise, that sort of thing. So they let the FCC do what they do best and UL does what they do best, which is really measuring uh, safety and compliance with standards. All right. The other thing, because this is all about demystifying. So what I'm doing is I'm taking some of the myths that we've heard uh, or some of the misunderstandings that I've heard and trying to clarify them for y'all. So one of that is there's different marks for tested products, all right? Listed and certified are the only ones that in my, that to the HJ actually really count, okay? Because listed and certified tells us the, that the equipment has undergone the full range of tests, okay? not just pick and choose. Uh, you can't really do that and claim that you've tested by a NERDL. Well, you can actually. There's a different classification for that. It's called classified. So if a product is classified to a list, to a, sorry, <laughs> a standard, that means that the manufacturer was able to pick and choose 
what they wanted it to test to. All right. So it is not the same as a listing because they could still be failing the standard in areas and they just chose not to test that area. Um, now you will recognize that really only applies to subcomponents. Uh, so for example, like the power supply modules that we use inside our BDAs, they're made by another company and they have a UL recognized mark, that backwards UR symbol that you see there on the screen. Um, another example is the, the battery kits that we offer for our listed BDAs. Those will also have that recognized mark. Now, if a product says that it complies with or conforms to, who cares? All that means is the manufacturer claims that they built it with the intent to pass the standard, but with no testing done at all. So from the, from the fire inspector's perspective, that should be pretty meaningless. But UL 2524 includes testing for the BDA, the battery backup, and a remote enunciator or an enunciator panel they don't really specify it needs to be a remote um so you know if i'm going to come out with just a bda and i don't make bbus or enunciators can i actually get a ul listing um it's i'm i have to admit i'm still a little confused uh one nerdle that we talked to said no you got to submit it as a system another nerdle we talked to said yeah, we can we can list just one piece. Now, I don't really understand that because, for example, like the circuit integrity. Um, so if I have a, a BD, let's say battery backup unit and a remote enunciator made by somebody else, and I put it onto a BDA who claims to be UL listed to 2524, well, how do I know that that circuit integrity is going to really work between those two devices? All right, so unless it's tested as a system, um you know i'm not sure that really counts so now really why is ul 2524 important or why is it going to be important in the future well here's the big news so the the 2021 version of ifc 510 is done it's out um and within that standard it actually says that equipment shall be listed to UL 2524 standard. So as cities adopt the latest code versions, I should say the future code versions, same for the 2022 version of NFPA, um, it's gonna say it in there. So as cities adopt those, the industry is going to have to respond with equipment that meets this standard. Um, happy to say Westo is one of the first manufacturers to come out with a listed product so and we have a lot more in the queue so something that we're very very uh, actively involved in there's also one line in the the last few versions of nfpa 72 section 10.3.1 if you want to look it up it says the equipment constructed and installed in conformity with this code shall be listed for the purpose for which it is to be used right, that's the language right out of there um now you know some folks have, some inspectors have used that as justification for asking for a purposeful listing or appropriate listing today um you know i have to say now that we have a product i'm happy to accept that interpretation uh, but Again, that's kind of subject to interpretation by the HJ. The other thing it does is it really provides assurance to the inspector that the equipment complies with the aspects of the code that, that equipment needs to comply with. All right, so, you know, in my conversation with, uh, you know, with electrical and fire inspectors, there's a certain amount of concern about who's liable, you know, for if something doesn't go well um so in a way this standards testing having it tested by an independent testing lab a certified osha recognized independent testing lab and it takes some of that liability away from them so that's one of the other reasons that a uh, a listing is important as i mentioned Westel came out with a product uh a dual band 7800 megahertz public safety bda 
half lot and two lot. And at the outset, we wanted to do three specific things. Um, we wanted something that was going to be easier for the installer. We wanted something that was going to be easier to get the HJ approval. And at the same time, we wanted to give or provide price leadership. We know it's a competitive business. The product efficiency, you know, how well it meets the needs and, and how efficiently we can do it uh, is all part of that. So, and, and cost factors into that. So here's a bit of a list of the things that we've added. So what we did is we took our existing PS series class B BDA, which is we've been out for years. Folks love them. They're one of the one of the com more common in the industry. And then we added about a dozen improvements. We now in the half watt, two watt use the same chassis. For anyone that's used to our two watt unit, it's roughly the same size and configuration as it. Um, as you can see, the size there, it's actually about half the size of many of our competitors out there so it's a very compact unit um, so it doesn't take up a lot of space on the walls when we talked about something that's that the hjs like well these telecom closets are often really crowded so we got to keep into account the overall size the footprint so one of the things we did is we added a front panel enunciator if this bda is going to be or able to go into the fire control room or wherever that enunciation is needed um then this eliminates the expense of that additional remote enunciator so not even needed now yes we are working on our own uh remote enunciator so that will be out i'm not going to say when yet but we're working on it the other thing we did is we changed how the bda's connections are working so you see on the right there uh, that's utilizing the conduit fitting. So with every BDA, we provide both the cable grip, the watertight cable grips, as well as uh, this um, liquid type flex conduit fittings. So now you have an option as an installer of do I run want to run cables in there or do I want to have everything like this super clean looking clean looking install and have everything run in the conduit. So your call there but we wanted to provide that option because uh well i know for example i was talking to a gentleman in uh, southern cal and they're having to take the their, the bda they're using now that has all these big connectors on the bottom and they run flex tight right up to the connector and then heat shrink it in order to make that assembly uh watertight so i think this is a much cleaner solution and also provides for one of the smallest footprints. So one of the things we do is we actually built the battery backup and alarming circuitry directly into the BDA. So the box below is just a battery box. So that allows us to have a very small footprint, uh, 26 wide by four foot high. So it's almost a half a sheet of ply or quarter sheet of plywood that we can fit this on. So really reduce the overall footprint. Um, NEMA 3R rated battery cabinet, wall mountable or floor, supports up to 160 amp hours. And we do now offer the battery kits. These are uh, very high grade telecom style 10 year life batteries. We've added some additional alarm capability. So NFPA now add, ask for a system component fail alarm don't really specify what it is. So we added one called system component fail for those inspectors that just simply want to see it. All of our alarm contacts are form C. So you get both normally open and normally closed contacts. Oh, I forgot, almost. We also added a alarm log web GUI based. So you can look back and see, you know, the last many thousands, well, hopefully there aren't thousands of alarms, but, um, you can go back and look at the alarm log. You can sort by type of alarm, um, criticality. Uh, you can export to a CSV file. So we've added that as well. Oh, forgot as well. Audible enunciator. So a lot of code, they want some audible enunciation on an alarm. So we have an audible enunciator that can be enabled or disabled during install uh, already inside the BDA. So again, we've took 
a lot of these things that folks are looking for and we built it all in. We also looked at how oscillation management works in BDAs. You know, and when I came, I was, I became aware a while back that there's some BDAs out there that during an oscillation event would just simply shut down. And this is a life safety system. The last thing you want a life safety system to do is just shut down when there's a problem. So we wanted our BDA to work as best as possible. All right, so what we did is we created this algorithm, this, I know it's a bit of an eye chart, it's not, in, it's not meant to, to study, but um, what it does basically is it finds the best possible operation available given the change in environment that caused the oscillation. And then it'll, it'll recheck a few times, not forever, but a few times to see if that changed. If it did, it goes back to original game. Because yeah, maybe it's just a bay door that opened that usually doesn't. Uh, a big truck that drove by that caused a reflection. Um, so some of these events are temporary, uh, some are permanent. So it'll retry a few times. If it doesn't, uh, it'll stay at that lowest gain where it's not causing us oscillation. Uh, if, if, it, if it's not remediable, it'll shut down. And anytime it's not operating at its original gain setting, you get an alarm. So you will know that this thing is not operating at full gain or at the gain that you set it to when you last commissioned and left it. So here's list pricing. So the top line is our half watt BDA, then the two watt BDA, uh, the BBC 003 is the battery cabinet. And the thing I wanna point out here is while you may notice that the BDAs themselves perhaps, well, from our old price, they did actually go up. But keeping in mind that now we built the BBU circuitry into that, when you take the BDA and the battery cabinet together, when we compare that to our previous series, so here we have on the left our new series, our enhanced BDAs, and on the right we have our existing half watt, two watt. We have a, we have a BBU 001, it lists for a little over $4,000, you add batteries, by the time you add all this up, um, we're now around or better than $1,000 less than we were before. We already had a very, very competitive price leadership position. Now we just trimmed another grand off of it. So we're looking out for the integrator trying to do what's best and help you win more deals. So with that, that was pretty much what I have. Thank you, Mike. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to present this to us. Thank you all for attending. Please send any questions you may have to sales at tallycom.com or the phone number listed on the left and be sure to reference this webinar. If you need technical or specific product support, the contact information for Westel is listed on the right. We'll be sure to get all of your questions answered. But Larry, if I have a question, how soon should I expect the response? We will attempt to have your answers back between 24 and 48 hours.